pop art creator Roy Lichtenstein satirized consumer ideals with his art-sized advertising-inspired colors, dots, and speech bubbles. His art presented a bold view of the world, full of dynamism and emotion. But Lichtenstein's pop art requires our mind to fill in the detail we cannot see. Lichtenstein requires us to join the dots. Michel Petit he was the head of the legal council in 2007. He leaves in 2008. He has been working as a lawyer and a lobbyist uh, for, for many years. And it turns out that he was also representing Philip Morris. And then he's the one who introduces the complaint or informs the SecGen, inform Catherine Day that uh, there is an OLAF complaint against uh, Commissioner Daly at the time. The Commission received a complaint from a tobacco producer, Swedish Match, alleging that it had been approached by a Maltese entrepreneur acting on behalf of Mr. John Daly, the Commissioner with responsibility for health and consumer policy. There is no conclusive evidence of the direct participation of Commissioner John Daly. The Maltese entrepreneur had used his contact with Mr. Daly to try to gain financial advantages from the company in return for seeking to influence a possible future legislative proposal on tobacco products. Nevertheless, there are a number of unambiguous, circumstantial pieces of evidence gathered in the course of the investigation indicating that he was indeed aware of the fact that this person was using his name to gain financial advantages. Commission, the SecGen and President Barroso received the report of Olaf uh, on one day and he's, he's dismissed or he, he resigns the following day. I think Barroso was too hasty. He, was, he seemed very eager to get rid of Commissioner Dali. He wasn't treated fairly. The, the investigation by o Olaf was very biased. It was not done properly. It is clear that Catherine Day had access to this first document and that the second one was changed after Dali resigned. And Michel Petit knew Catherine Day very well from his days uh, when he was head of the legal service of the, of the European Parliament. So there's a link. Petit, Philip Morris, Mr. Daly informed Catherine Day. It's very, very bizarre. So when Health Commissioner John Daly was forced from office, the political machine was unmasked. Catherine Day, the Commission's powerful Secretary General, was found to be delicately linked to his downfall. She didn't act out of personal financial gain, she acted out of political belief. I just want to stress that when the highest civil servant of the EU Commission, Catherine Day, is playing a political role, not a civil servant's role, and he's setting an agenda, and when people inside the Commission tell me that there are some words about re-regulation that Catherine will kill every time it comes to her desk and everything comes to her desk, uh, well then, again, you don't need a lobby. The lobby is inside. Tobacco lobbying is a toxic subject in Brussels. The battle lines are drawn with health arguments on one side, the tobacco industry on the other, and the European Commission at war with itself. One of the most controversial pieces of legislation ever to go through the European Parliament has recently been passed, the European Tobacco Products Directive. What we have is for the first time across the whole EU, we will have big warnings on all cigarette packages. We will take the gimmick products off the market, the ones that are designed to lure children into becoming smokers, and we will regulate e-cigarettes for the first time. The EU's new Tobacco Products Directive requires tobacco products to have 65% of the packaging covered with health warnings. We have not seen reliable evidence that demonstrates that making the warnings bigger actually makes them more effective. This directive basically stops us or makes it much more difficult for us to compete for the existing adult smokers. It will hinder our ability to innovate, force particular products off the market, for example, menthol cigarettes will be banned in 2020. I went to menthol cigarettes for fresh taste, sure. But these have so much menthol taste, they drown out tobacco taste. The assumption that everybody who currently smokes menthol cigarettes will then just quit smoking is not one that we believe in. We believe that most menthol smokers who will not find their products anymore in 2020 will either switch to conventional, non-mentholated cigarettes or might want to find menthol cigarettes on the black market even. 
What do you think the industry was telling Secretary General that you couldn't argue against? Many things. The one, first one argument is the economic burden. The second argument that they use is we don't have any proof that these measures will work and they will have an impact. The third key argument was it will create massive illicit trade, which is something that they always use. They're not based on science or evidence. And in fact, this is what DG Sanko, who stood strong, proved with its impact assessment that everything that they were saying were lies. Tobacco kills 700,000 Europeans every year. That's the size of a city. It's a strange industry which kills its own consumers. In the end, tobacco is a product. Uh, we all know it's a dangerous product. It kills uh, one of or two of its consumers, but it's there. Uh, so public authorities, national authorities have to deal with it and we need to have rules like directive we, we, which was just adopted. We believe that those who have chosen to smoke tobacco products should be entitled to buy and select the tobacco products that they want. Light up the lucky, just light up time. Be happy, go lucky, just light up time. For the taste that you like, light up the lucky strike. Relax. Light of time. Were you approached by lobbyists as well from yeah. the tobacco industry? Yes. What was their What was their position? What was their argument? Uh, it's interesting because uh, I had a couple of meetings, uh, uh, but we discussed really. Uh, well, their position first of all was, let's adopt it as soon as possible, because we need clarity. Uh, the second. The discussion was where are the real problems of the implementation. What was the level of opposition you had from the tobacco industry? It was absolutely huge uh, and it was also by stealth. So it was direct and indirect and in fact I would say that the indirect uh, pressure by the tobacco industry making links and making alliances with groups which are not easily identified as the tobacco industry was essential to them. What about the so-called AstroTurf uh, lobbyists, those from small businesses and who are organised by the tobacco industry to make representations but don't appear on, on the lobby register as tobacco? Well, if they, if, if they have uh, an issue, uh, I think they are entitled to represent themselves. Uh, we didn't push anyone to lobby on our behalf, uh, but if you, are, if you have a small business and if you are concerned about your business, then clearly you should be entitled to represent your own interests. In 2012, before the directive came out of the Commission, a third of European parliamentarians had been contacted one by one. Did you think the game was fairly played or was it more aggressive than you'd be used to? No, I think in a council, yeah, it was fair play. There, there was no meaning, oh, we want this and uh, otherwise something happens, you know. We knew who we were talking to. I mean, it's an industry. Uh, uh, it's, it's an industry which wants to have more people consuming its products. We're saying on the record that these products are dangerous and they have to be regulated. So in the end, it's the politicians who will decide, the parliament, the member states, and they're going to be new rules on, the, on, on, on tobacco in, in the future. Contrary to what some organizations, particularly linked to industry, have tried to portray, this is not a directive which prohibits smoking or prohibits e-cigarettes. It just regulates them. And I think we have a duty uh, to do so within an internal market which is a single market as well. Conflict within the European Commission is at the heart of a growing divide in Europe, a divide between those who see the European project in terms of pure economic interests, the advancement of the single market and those who see a more socially responsible Europe with a paternalistic view of how Europe's citizens should live. The overall aims of, of the European Union is of course the internal market, uh, the Tobacco Products Directive of course is based on the internal market, so health is not in the minds of those at the highest level. And if you have a language of internal market, which the industries generally have, then you have a natural entry. If we have been able to speak to the European Commission, I think we'd be more worried about the, the lack of effect uh, that our messaging has had. But largely, it has been ignored. I think all MEPs would have been approached by lobbyists. As a rapporteur, we uh, followed very carefully the guidelines on, on how to deal with the tobacco lobby. And so we had a public hearing where they were able to come and present their views and that was it. That was the end of my discussions with the tobacco industry. Was their lobbying effective in the end? 
I would say that uh, when you overstep the mark, then it sort of backfire. And I think they overstepped the mark. And in the end, it wasn't as effective as they would have liked. When the Commission tabled its proposal, the uh, anti-tobacco uh, NGO said it's not enough, and the tobacco industry said it's too much. So probably the Commission proposal was the right one. The tobacco lobby pushed really hard here in the European Parliament. But most MEPs say that the end result was a fair piece of legislation. But questions remain about the closeness of the European Commission to the tobacco industry. Catherine Day's role in the Tobacco Products Directive raises serious questions, not just about the revolving doors of the European Commission, which has allowed senior officials to leave through one door and enter as lobbyists through another, but also about the accountability of unelected officials. Day's capacity to delay the tobacco directive is a kind of political gamesmanship without accountability. As the Nobel economist Adam Smith might have said, Catherine Day's influence on the tobacco market was an almost invisible hand. We invited Catherine Day and Michel Petit to contribute to this program, but they both declined to comment on this occasion. A European Commission spokesperson did agree to respond on behalf of Catherine Day. And in our next program on lobbying, we will hear from the Commission regarding Catherine Day. Our invitation for Michel Petit to comment remains open.